So, what makes a compelling reference photo? That's my big question. And I've seen a lot of reference photos. I've seen my own. I've seen ones from um, teachers that I've been a student of over the years. And I've definitely seen a lot of reference photos from students as well. And of course, you guessed it, reference photos from students often don't lead to successful paintings. That's why we're here today to talk about that. So the first thing to say that I see a lot of is that a photo, a reference photo in particular, a reference photo, a compelling reference photo, isn't just a memory, right? We do a lot of photo taking and we do it when we are on trips or when we have a special event and we, you know, it's, it's full of emotions for us. Those are things that prompt us to take photos. And those are often the things that students want to paint right? These are what's compelling to them. And, you know, the truth is, is that it's, it's a funny sort of conundrum, but what often is at the heart of the problem is sort of the heart of the student. You are super attached to the events that led to the taking of that photo. You have all these memories that are part of how you experience that photo. And it is fleshing it out, and filling it with life, and bringing back to you all the emotional content that you had when you were on that trip to the Grand Canyon, or when your daughter got married, or when you took a trip to Europe, or to the coast, or whatever it might be, wherever you went, and whatever you did, right? Wherever you whoever you were with, all those important, special things that are super valuable, right? But they're not necessarily valuable for the reference photo, right? When we think about a reference photo, the purpose is to create, to have a, um, a starting point for what will end up being a compelling painting. So, I need us to start thinking about something from the outside. We need to think about our subject from the exterior, not just from the inside, where we have all of this emotional content that we're bestowing to the subject. The, the story of a, of a finished painting is, is definitely part of the power of a painting. So I don't want to like denigrate that. That's really important. And I think if you are looking at all kinds of other older paintings, that have emotional content, you know, a Norman Rockwell, a Van Gogh, whatever's going on in those paintings has a story and the story is important. But additionally, that story is aided by the way in which it is told. It's not having to duke it out with, you know, the material of the painting itself. So they have to work in cohort. And since you are already manned, with all of the emotional content that you need, that's something to set aside when we're thinking about, okay, what do I want to actually use as a reference photo? Because, of course, anybody else that is viewing your painting, they don't have your emotional baggage. They don't have your emotional content. So we need to figure out how to embed some of that drama into the way in which we paint it, right, into the way in which we compose it. So that's definitely a whole other level than technique, right? That was the last video, and it's about, you know, what comes after technique. And so now we're talking about how do we choose a compelling photo or how do we turn a compelling, uh, a not-so-compelling photo into something that can become a useful reference photo. So... Of course, I'm talking about composition. Now, that's a really broad subject, and I want to simplify it and bring it down to something that I, you know, details that I think are applicable and straightforward 
and have a lot of bang for their buck before we get into lots of nuance about you know, fine details of composing an interesting subject. Everything starts out with some basic, simple compositional techniques. Right? These are five guidelines, and they can help you either take a better photo or they can help you edit a photo to improve it. And this definitely is all stuff you know, I didn't make it up out of the universe. I, I was based, born out of my own personal experience. And I do this sort of stuff all the time for myself. And it's definitely what I would recommend for you as well. So number one is hunt for contrast. If you don't have bold contrast in your photo, it's going to be really flat. And that's often why people are talking about how it's hard to take a good reference photo when it's cloudy out because everything's pretty flat. It reduces the, the range of values that you have available for yourself. So you need strong contrast. You're going to hunt for it. You're going to peek around inside of that little reference photo to find it. Or you're going to look through in the phone and you're going to find a section like, oh, this is interesting contrast here. It can be value contrast, bold color contrast, things like that. You're going to, and if you take a photo, and you've got something, my goodness, I'm always telling people, zoom in and crop, zoom, zoom in and, and crop. There's all this um, extraneous, totally unessential detail in millions and millions of reference photos. So zoom in and crop, right? And you have this contrast you were hunting for, and it's there inside of the section where you're zooming in and cropping. Because, right, I'm sure you've heard this kind of quote, where it says, you know, if everything is important, then nothing is important. And that's definitely true for a reference photo. You need to trim away what isn't important. When you crop, number three is that you want to find a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Now, this doesn't work for something like a portrait of a person because it's only them. And sometimes we do portraits of things, trees, leaves flowers, those aren't about creating depth. So it doesn't apply to that specifically, but for a million landscape things, it does. We want something in the foreground, like a stage. We want something in the middle ground, like the actors that are on the stage. And we want something in the distance. That's going to be our background. That's the stage setting. And it's important to recognize that the stage and the stage setting should not be competing with your actors. They are there to help guide you into the subject and they're there to help create mood. And we don't want to have a photo where your background is competing with the primary subject. That can be a problem. And sometimes zooming in can help solve some of those problems because it'll help you understand what you grow up and what is the most essential pieces of your composition. Number four is that you want to stack your shapes. So we don't, sometimes you'll have like a boat and a mountain and a lake, but nothing is integrating with each other. And that can become really difficult to move through the painting. So we want to find things where we can stack our shapes. I'm often telling people to, you know, you need to move to a different location if you're taking a photo and see if you can stack different shapes. And sometimes that will create an interesting arrangement of shapes for you that isn't so on the nose. And the fourth, the fifth thing is that you want to simplify your shapes. So sometimes when you zoom in and crop, if you have a really busy scene, you help zoom in. When you, when you zoom in, it helps you create stronger, bigger, more simplified shapes. And that can be really helpful when you're trying to communicate to somebody who doesn't have all that emotional content, right? We need to find a way to break it down to the essential. That zooming in can help you create strong shape, help you simplify them. But that's also where no tan come in. So simplifying shapes, that is, right? But that is what no tans are just so wonderful at. They're really, that's they're just a powerful, powerful tool for simplifying shapes. Now, if you do 
the other four um, basic compositional um, steps. You hunt for contrast, you zoom in and crop, you make sure when you arrange whatever you're cropping to have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and you start to stack your strong shapes. If you do those four, you're going to have a reference photo that is a much better tool for communicating the emotional content that you wanted to communicate when you go to paint, right? It's going to be an interesting arrangement of shapes and an interesting arrangement of contrasts that'll make it compelling for the eye so that you want to dive in and explore the content in the painting more. The fifth one, simplifying your shapes, that's really something to be done when you have a note because of course at the end of this process you're like great now i've got a nice photo i guess what do i do with it how do i turn this into a painting so the first step really of mark making is a no tan that's that's how i see it that's how we go over it in from photo to final painting so in the next video actually i'm going to do it live and then in the, in this next post we're going to have a, a live session and I'm going to go over how to take a photo. Let's take one, take two, and we'll push it through these five compositional um, rules and out will come a nice little reference photo. And then we'll also build a note hand from it and that'll get you another step closer to, you know, how do I simplify this crazy busy stuff? How do I arrange my shapes to make them more interesting? And the Note 10 is a really helpful tool. So I hope this conversation is helpful. I would um, check out your photos. See if you can apply these principles to existing photos to make them even stronger. I am cropping stuff all the time. It is a big piece of how I find content. So it's very, very useful. It, it, I just it, My point is to say it's not like I'm just you know, I'm spewing off some stuff, but I don't practice it. These are all things I do all the time when I'm painting. So I would propose do it yourself for your own work. And if you are dissatisfied with your reference photos, once you're starting to look at it in this way, go out, take some reference photos with these principles in mind, and um, it'll help you. Until next time, you guys. Bye-bye.